out of all my shame. Break these chains and set me free. Lord, I want to be washed clean. Don't you know? just in need but you took these hands and washed them clean oh like a blind man lost in the middle of the night you came down and you opened my eyes and I won't ever be the same oh that's just what Jesus Jesus did for me It's great to see everyone out uh, this morning. Um, in the way of announcements, uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, we want you to feel welcome, okay? Uh, there's a visitor card in the pew. Uh, if you would, take one of those, fill it out, just drop it in the offering plate. Um, and the, we'll get that to Brother Rick as he uh, as he's out of town. Uh, they are in Tampa. There's a large group in Tampa, Florida, uh, competing in the, the national competition. But I want you to understand it's not really just a competition. I want you to understand that, yes, they compete, uh, but it's more about these kids learning these songs, learning scripture, learning Bible verses, and allowing that to be embedded in their heart. Uh, next week, uh, we'll have a, a family with us, a missionary family. Uh, Daniel Lindsay will be with us next week, next Sunday. Uh, today is Canned Food Sunday. Uh, and then I mentioned the, the National Convention. Uh, two weeks service will resume uh, in August. Uh, we'll go back to two weeks uh, or two services in August. And that starting that on the August the 4th, we're going to have, uh, that's not going to start our 21 days of fasting. We're actually going to start on the 5th, uh, which will be that following Monday. Uh, so that will give you one more day. And we're going to have prayer journals and things like that that we can pass out on that Sunday. Uh, but that Sunday the 4th, we're also going to have a uh, family game night uh, and a, fel a fellowship. Uh, that will start at 5 o'clock at the Family Life Center. So uh, bring finger food, foods and drinks uh, and your favorite board game. Uh, and I think we're going to even play volleyball that, that night also. Uh, and if there's, if you got any, um, you know, anything that, that we're coming up on a new year, so if, if you feel like you want to serve in some capacity, uh, just get your bulletin and check those names on the uh, that are that are heading that up, and.
getting everybody's classes together and making sure everybody wants to teach because there's somewhere for you to serve uh, in, in this church. So um, at this time, we'll dismiss all of our nursery and toddlers uh, and a children's church. Uh, and that'll take about seven or eight minutes. And then uh, we'll have the uh, worship team come back up and we'll get started with service. I heard an old, old story How the Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins
After the announcements, I went back to my seat over there. My son said, uh, man, you need to loosen up a little bit. We're really tight, really tight. I said, okay, well, you just come on up here, and you can just, you can just, you can just be with me up here then, right? Let's see how tight he is, right? Uh, and it is true. You know, it's, it's very, very difficult to stand up here in front of a lot of people uh, and proclaim God's word. But uh, I've been doing that for a, for a little while now uh, for the ones that, that doesn't know me. Uh, I've uh, answered the call to preach several years back, and I've I kind of fill in at churches around, uh, and then I fill in here when when needed. Uh, so if y'all don't come back, don't let it be on count of me, okay? Right? You know, come back because uh, this is where we're going to preach the word of God, uh, and we're gonna we're gonna hold true to what it says, uh, and we're not gonna we're not gonna waver from that. Uh, you know, I want to thank uh, Corlin and uh, and the group this morning. They did such a fantastic job, and I'm always thankful for this opportunity to to get up here and share God's word. Um, another thing that will probably happen today is uh, y'all will beat everybody to lunch. Uh, so I'm not very long winded. Uh, Rick is, uh, you know, he can he can get on those uh, run those rabbits. You know, I'm 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 kind of strictly by the book here. So uh, yeah, so there that's that's good news already. Uh, but you know, back in Jesus' day, uh, Jesus had uh, a lot of enemies. Uh, people were always trying to trap him in saying the wrong thing or, or even doing the wrong thing, right? You know, I had the Pharisees always trying to, to, to get at Jesus, you know, they didn't like. Uh, and these enemies of Jesus were most of the time the religious leaders of that day. They were, you know, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees. You know, and as Jesus' popularity grew, you know, as he did all these signs and miracles, uh, that, you know, they, they, and him even chastising these leaders, you know, coming at them because of 
what they would do with the word of God. Uh, he grew more and more, they, or they grew more and more against him. And that's what we're going to see this morning. We're going to see uh, a guy stand up. So if you will, you can turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 10. We'll be in Luke chapter 10 this morning. And so that's kind of where we're at. We're at Jesus, you know, he's, he's sent out. He sent out his 12, he sent out his 70, and uh, he's teaching right here. Uh, and this is what's considered the parable of uh, the Good Samaritan. Um, and we're going to start in verse 25, Luke 10 and 25. First, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, uh, we just ask that you, you come down and anoint your word, Father. God, just help me to get out of the way, Father, and just uh, allow your word to be uh, ever-present, God, and just pierce the hearts of your people today, God. And we just want to give you all the praise and honor and glory. We just ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right. Everybody got it? Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law, and what is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. But he wanting to justify himself asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Verse 25 says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, I think that's the, uh, on the minds of a lot of people today. I think that's on the minds of a lot of church-going people today. What must I do to inherit the kingdom, inherit eternal life? And the law right here has the answer in verse 27. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you know, this was correct. Do this and you will live. It sounds easy, right? It sounds really easy just to, to love God and love people. But the problem with that is no one can hold perfectly to the law. You know, as humans, we have this sin nature. We have this flesh that kicks up, that we struggle with inside internally. And this was passed down from the very beginning. You know, instead of this lawyer who was an expert in the law now, understand this, this lawyer, that means that he, was, he knew the law backwards and forwards. Instead of him seeking mercy, he wanted to justify himself and asking, who is my neighbor? See, the, you know, the religious leaders of this day, they were real self-righteous. They held their self to a different standard than everybody else. They, they even, they thought that only the righteous was their neighbor. That's what they thought. They, they believed that if you were, if you were, quote unquote, with them or in their, in their group, that you were righteous, and they were that 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 would make them your neighbor. But in Matthew five and forty three, Jesus says, "You have heard it that it was said," meaning that's what these Pharisees and scribes have taught you. You have heard it said this way. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's what these religious leaders was teaching in this day. They were teaching that you should love your neighbor, love the ones that are right with God, and hate your, hate your enemy. Well, who would be your enemy? It would be the tax collectors. It would be the prostitutes. 
It would be to sinners. They were being taught to hate these type people. But Jesus said, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Well, that's two different ends of the spectrum there. They've been taught by these religious leaders that only the righteous, if they had an enemy, that they just hated their enemy. Where Jesus tells them that they're supposed to love their enemy. How hard is that to do? It kind of made me think about an, uh, something that happened to me about, it's been about four or five weeks ago, I guess. Uh, I was at the shop and I sell chemicals. Uh, I had a guy come in that I've known for years. Uh, Dad knew him. He's been a, you know, a customer for, for a really long time. But I've known that his, he had vehicle trouble. And so I was asking him about his vehicle. You know, if he got it to the shop, if he'd, you know, had it repaired and, and worked on. And, and, of course, he just, he just goes into a, a whole line of excuses. You, you, I mean, he, he blamed his brother's business, that was a successful business, that, that maybe, you know, it was just everybody was against him. Well, I didn't want to hear that. So I shut down, and I just, you know, I kind of got what he needed and just, you know, I was real short. I was real blunt and just tried to get him pushed out the door. And when I did, my brother turned to me, and he said, man, you really don't like that guy, do you? Kind of hit me between the eyes there. And then, I, of course, I started making excuses. I started trying to adjust, justify who my neighbor was. And I, I can imagine that each one of you in here today have done the same thing at some point. You know, why do we do this? Why do we do, allow our flesh to kick up? And when this guy maybe needed an encouraging word, instead I just pushed him, pushed him out the door like, I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to hear it. And then I turn around and make excuses why I don't like him. Why I don't like his excuses. Hopefully we can answer that question as we move, move forward here. So Jesus goes right into his parable after being asked this question, who is my neighbor, right? Because this guy has, is obviously, he don't have that many neighbors because it's just the, the righteous. It's just the ones that they think are right by God is who their neighbor is. So pick up with me right here in verse 30. Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from, Jer from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend... When I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him of, who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This road that was traveled here was a rocky winding descent of about 3,300 feet. Over 17 miles. And it was notorious for thieves and 
and to be extremely dangerous. And we see that the priest and the Levite come, and they just kind of, man, I got I to gotta keep moving on. I, I don't have time to deal with this. You know, this would be like the church today. Just passing up somebody that's laid half dead in a ditch. This would be people that knew the law. It's not people that didn't know the law. Let me put it that way. They knew the law. They understood what was required of them. But yet, if they touched this man that was wounded, you know, they would be probably deemed unclean and they would have to go through a ceremonial process. You know, it was just a lot of paperwork to go with this. And they chose to pass by with very little concern. But the Samaritan had compassion. And we understand who the Samaritans are, right? They were hated by the Jews. They were despised and basically rejected. And one of their biggest oppositions that between the Jews and the, the Samaritans was where they worshipped God. You know, the Jews said you had to worship in Jerusalem. Well, the Samaritans was on a mountain. And this is one of their biggest, the biggest problems that they faced. And that's why they hated each other so much. But this Samaritan, he uses all of his resources. He uses his wine for cleaning the wounds and oil for soothing relief, transportation to safety. He even pays two denarii, which is two days' wages. Not only that, plus any extra. It sounds a lot like Jesus. Someone who has compassion, who was rejected and despised and used all of his resources. He used his life to preserve provides safety and mercy for each of us. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the one who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy to him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Back to the first question that the lawyer asked, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? To a religious expert who thinks he knows what to do to obtain eternal life, Jesus tells the story of a man who can do absolutely nothing to save himself. A man lying in a ditch completely helpless ends up relying on an outsider a Samaritan to save him. What would it take for the lawyer to realize that priests and Levites do not offer eternal life? Nor does obeying God's law. Religion cannot save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you. You can do whatever you want to do for the Lord, but that does not, by no means, grant you eternal life. Don't let anybody ever tell you that you can work your way into heaven, because that is false. How can we go and do likewise? How can we be like the Samaritan when... We struggle with picking and choosing who our neighbor is. How can we be the person that God's called us to be when we, when we pick and choose? I believe the answer is found in verse 27. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your 
strength, and with all your mind. See, this lawyer skipped right over the first part of the command and went right to justifying who his neighbor was. How many times do we do that? Because I'm here to tell you, if you put God first, then you'll know who your neighbor is. That's the, that's the, that's the church's biggest problem is putting God first. So many times we put ourselves first. Even the one speaking to you this morning, I put myself before others. And that's not what we're called to. God has got to be first in everything that we do, everything that we say. Going back to Jesus, which is our standard. You know, Jesus came to this earth to do his father's will. That's what he came to do. He came to do, to submit himself to his father. And by doing that, he died for your sin and my sin. He did that so we could obtain compassion and mercy. You know, when Jesus saves you, he provides a gift with endless resources. The gift of the Holy Spirit. But so many times we don't put the Holy Spirit first in our life. So we miss out on all those resources. We miss out on mercy. We miss out on compassion. We miss out on forgiveness. We miss out on grace. When we love the Lord with all our heart, it is very difficult for us not to see who our neighbor is. So this morning, I want to ask you, where do you see, where do you see yourself? Are you the priest and the Levite, the churchgoers that just turn a blind eye to their neighbor? Or are you the Samaritan that lends a helping hand every time you see it? I would suggest that everyone here today at some point is the person in the ditch. We're held captive to sin. We're left dying in need of mercy. We're helpless. We're helpless. We need someone to come along and save us. And that would be Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one that can help you this morning. Your buddy can give you good advice. Your spouse can encourage you. But Jesus is the only answer. So as I get ready to close this morning. Are you in need this morning? Are you tired of trying to do things to earn your way into heaven? Because there's only one way, and that's surrendering to Jesus as your Lord. You can do all the good things you want, but until you put Jesus Christ first, you'll never know who your neighbor is. If that's you this morning, I pray that you would surrender your life to Jesus. I pray that you would ask Jesus to come into your life so that you may receive the gift of eternal life. And maybe you're here this morning and 
you're struggling to put God first in your day-to-day decisions, in your day-to-day conversations. I pray today that you would put your selfishness aside and allow God to be first in your life. I pray that you would seek forgiveness and mercy this morning. I don't know what your need is this morning. And it ranges from one end to the other. But God is the only one that can help you. Jesus Christ is the only one that can fill that void. He's the only one that can save you. Stop trying to justify who your neighbor is. Put God first and allow God to open your eyes to see the need that is around you. I'm talking about the the need of people dying and going to hell every day because you won't get right with God. God wants to use you. He wants to use each and every one of you in his work, in what he's doing, in the kingdom that he's trying to build. He wants to use you, but until you put him first, he can't. So I'm going to ask that you bow your heads this morning. Somebody's dealing with something this morning that they need to turn over to God. And we're going to do just like we do every Sunday. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have a moment for you to, to pray. I encourage you to come to the altar and give it over to Jesus Christ this morning. Father God, we come to you just lifting your name up, Father, because you're so good to us. God, even when we don't deserve it, Father, you're, you're right there. Handing out compassion and mercy, God, and your grace is... Oh, it's so great. Father, help us to receive that today. God, help us to put our selfish desires aside. Father, help us to put our pride aside. Help us to put our arrogance aside. Father, humble us before you this morning. God, and I pray for the one that doesn't know you this morning that's trying to do everything right, Father. God, but they're weary. They're they're tired of trying to do. Father, when all they got to do is just put you first. God, I pray for that person today. God, I pray that you would just pierce their heart, God, and give them the desire to want to seek after you and run after you. Father, I pray for the one that is struggling today. God, they they walk with you and they they have conversations with you, Father. They believe in you and they trust you, Father, but they've got caught up in the business of this life and they've strayed away. God, I pray that you would just pierce their hearts, Father. God, and we're going to ask it all in Jesus Christ's name. Will your head bowed, your head bowed and your eyes closed? If you need to come, come on, this altar's open.
And all God's people said, amen. Thank you all so much for, for hanging in there with me. I know it wasn't, wasn't too much, but uh, the thing is, God deserves to be first for what he's done for us. Don't let a day go past that you don't put him first in your life. And with all that, I'll ask that everyone stand. Greg Allen, will you close us in prayer?